about 10% of all viewing is over the air, but now we're down to 86% live, 13% with DVR. Now it's sort of ironic because there's heavy DVR penetration as I'm going to show you in a moment, but a lot of the viewing is still live. And why is that? Most people want to watch sports live. They want to watch shows that they're Facebooking or tweeting with friends on live. Otherwise, spoiler alert, you're going to hear what's going on <laughs> be before you're ready to watch it. And then there's other people who just aren't as used to using DVRs. So the younger folks, clearly, much more in the mode of, let me skip the commercials. Let me be as efficient as I can. But the older generations, less so. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. And video on demand is still at about 1%. Now, what we're seeing is a trend towards certain shows getting really high playback numbers. So if we take a look here at Better Call Saul, 75% in February viewed it on replay, did not view it live. So that's either video on demand or DVR replay. <coughs> Why is that? Sometimes people like doing that so they can binge and watch a whole bunch at once. Other times, in the more likely cases, they had a better show they wanted to watch or a show they want to watch with friends at that same time, and therefore they had to record this one and they simply watched it at a later time. But look at these three shows. Those are massive numbers of, of replay stats, which can affect the advertising viewing. As, as you would expect, most people with DVRs are not viewing the ads, although a few do. My wife sometimes starts knitting. She controls the remote. She doesn't notice when the commercial comes on, and afterwards says, oh, I just saw a commercial. I'm not sure there's any recall to that commercial she saw. <laughs> which is a whole other matter, but it, it does go towards, it's very hard to, to measure these things. Now, what's really going on these days with TV viewership? We've all seen stats about how TV viewership has really dropped. Some statistics have said 40% of the third and fourth quarter TV ratings last year is a drop, and it's due to watching subscription video on demand, Netflix, other kinds of forms of non-TV viewing. We'll go through a few slides talking about the phenomenon, talking about what's going on with it, and I also have an alternative theory in terms of what may be going on. So first of all, let's take a look at the subscription universe, what else you can do in non-traditional forms of TV viewing. 76%, three quarters of all TV households use either a DVR, video on demand, or Netflix. Three quarters of all households use some form of delayed alternative viewing. 60% today have DVRs. So this is up from just a third five years ago and up from almost nothing 10 years ago. Massive penetration. DVRs are one of the fastest penetrating consumer devices ever um, created. And then a third of all households are Netflix subscribers. High numbers. Now, it doesn't say they only watch Netflix. It doesn't say they watch a lot of Netflix. They're paying the 8 to $10 a month to Netflix for the right to, to use them. Okay, There we go. Let's dig into Netflix a little bit further. There aren't good stats on Netflix because they choose not to reveal their statistics. Anybody have a theory for why they don't want to share their numbers with anybody? Yes? They have a ton of inac inactive accounts that are paying money. Okay. Yeah? Maybe they aren't the best. They're not number one. So yeah. they don't, they want to be perceived as number one, but maybe they're not number one. Both of you have, have some rightness to it. There, there, there's really two factors here. One is they don't have to. They're not selling ads. The advertisers aren't demanding it. The networks that sell them programs aren't willing to demand it, or they've been told no and they take it as, as the final answer, as opposed to, if I were a network, I'd want to know how many households are watching this because it shows how much I'm going to be degraded in terms of any other viewing of me. But the other reason could be, and it, it falls very much towards that answer, of if you aren't that high of a rating and you don't report, people may think, Better call, or may, may think that Orange is the New Black or any of their other new shows are performing better than they otherwise do. And you get a lot more buzz in the press if people think that. And nobody has any stats to refute it. Now here, I'm using these stats from an industry analyst who spent a lot of time trying to analyze how well they're doing. So they're educated guesses. They're, they're not necessarily absolutely accurate. But look at this. 7.2 billion hours spent watching Netflix in the first quarter. It's huge. They're the number two network, second only to CBS on the basis of the hours viewed. Again, absolutely huge stats. And then this is one I like the best. On average, the subscribers spend two hours a day watching Netflix. Whoa. I mean, where do they find the time? But it compares to the average adult in the United States spends five hours a day watching. So 
I guess by comparison, it, it isn't as, as large as it otherwise seems. So very large numbers here, and we'll talk as we talk about the future over where can this go <coughs> as we move forward. Looking at all the subscription services, Netflix is the leader, but then you also have Amazon with 11% of the population using it, Hulu, and then the, the platforms, um, PlayStation and Xbox have much, much smaller numbers of people who view through those platforms. But fairly nice numbers here in terms of an industry that's grown up over only the last couple of years. Now, here's a second school of thought. Sus second school of thought says, you know, <coughs> people may be watching somewhat less TV, but really they may be watching on different devices, and we're just not very good at measuring those other devices. So right now, Nielsen does not measure tablets or phones as part of their normal ratings. So when we look at ratings being down, they're not including any viewing of normal TV shows on alternative devices. They do it for PCs <coughs> because they have good data there. They're having real trouble with the way that compression works for tablets or phones of getting that pixel back that lets them know when a show's been watched. It's not steady, it's not a routine. For two years they've been trying to do it, said they're all set to do it. I don't criticize them here, nobody else has done it very well either, but it's just a fact. The viewing, it, the viewing measurement is not as refined and is not as well developed for watching on these alternative sources. And that could be very well what's going on. Viewing is there, but we simply don't realize it. Now let's take a look at tablets. 2010, they were at 3%. Currently, 42% of American adults own a tablet. I find this statistic mind-boggling. That's a lot of people. What it also implies is most households have two tablets. Now with kids, they may even have more than two tablets. This is just dealing with adults. But when you consider the cost of a tablet and what that means for the whole country, these are absolutely huge numbers, and they point towards a continuing trend towards some form of viewing on tablets. Now, they're used for a lot more than just TV viewing, but TV viewing is a part of that. Four and five online adults have smartphones. And given now the larger form factor of smartphones, you can expect more and more TV viewing to be taking place on these phones. And I see people, whether they're on buses or whether they're sitting around airports, viewing um, TV shows on their phones. Not quite as satisfying as a larger device, but I guess it depends what you have at the moment. Let's take a look at how much cord cutting is going on. Here's over the air, the top line, 12 million dips to 11 million, back up to 12 million. These are households that view over the air. That's 10 to 11% of all American households. Fairly steady, although it's interesting, we've done studies that show it varies greatly by city. Some cities are as high as 20% over the air. Some cities are as low as, say, 4 or 5% over the air. So huge differences there. And down here are those who have broadband only. It's gone from 1 million households in 2013 to about 3 million households in 2014. So in other words, the cord cutting phenomenon is still really tiny. I read articles all day, every day, about what's going on with cord cutting, why everybody's going to be viewing on tablets. Because it's an important part of our business because we're much stronger in traditional TV than we are in tablets. But in reality, the business isn't there yet. Now, in five years, it could take over entirely. But today, it's really tiny. And the ad dollars behind this broadband usage is about $2 billion a year of ads for over-the-top TV shows versus $75 billion for traditional TV. And traditional TV is still growing, albeit low, at a low rate, 3 to 5% a year, where the, the broadband may be almost doubling. But still, it's going to take a while to get up to material numbers. It's coming, but it's still going to take a while before it gets there. Now let's talk about the whole cord cutting phenomenon. As everybody knows, oh, you can really save some money as you unbundle. You can or you can't. It depends on what your needs are. For a bundle, you may pay $90 a month. Obviously, it'll vary by cable operator. About $1,000 a year. Nobody ever thinks of it in the terms of, oh my god, I'm spending $1,000 a year for this. <laughs> but take a look at the cost of one bundle. If you simply say, I'm going to get a digital antenna and view it on my phone or my tablet and just view over the air, I mean, that's $40 one time and then it's almost free. Of course, it is real time. You have no DVR. You can buy a DVR for over the air um, from TiVo. I mean, you can do other kinds of things to, to make this better. It's all going to cost you money. You have to buy your internet subscription. And those are only going up in cost, since the same guys who offer the bundle also offer the internet subscription. And then you have to start buying shows. OK, you've got Netflix for about $8 a month. CBS All Access for $6 a month. Sounds fantastic until you realize it has no football, because they've already sold the football rights. Um, and they can't do that on, on this as well. Hulu Plus, $8 a month. Gives you a couple of networks. Sling TV, 
Great deal if you like sports, you get ESPN and ESPN2. It's for one screen only. It won't work very well for a family unless you hook it up to your, your TV set. So a part of what's going on here is what's going on between families, what's going on with usage, what kind of usage do people really want to take? When somebody gets married, they and their spouse have very different TV watching habits. Maybe sports on one side, maybe, I, I don't know, whatever. I don't want to stereotype the situation. But there's very different habits. And then when you have kids, very different habits again. And here's another example. Take a look at what happens when you add in WWE at $10 a month, or Noggin at $6, or Vessel at $3. All of a sudden, you're up to substantially higher costs, and you've got to pay six or seven different providers instead of one provider. Now, there's some people out there who just hate the cable operator and want to jam it to the cable operator. That's fine. Most people are going to look at this at least a little bit economically or a little bit from ease. But if you find that you do want to watch a variety of channels, it's much harder to do that as opposed to saying, hey, I've got three or four I want to watch, and that's all I need. I can easily do that with a Netflix or easily do that with an ESPN or, or whatever that is. And there's a real interest on the part of the MSOs not to make this easy. So as an example, a little known part of Sling is if they, they cannot sell more than 2 million subscriptions to Sling, or ESPN has the right to rescind the right to distribute it. ESPN was not going to let them destroy their economics by having everybody sign up individually, because ESPN's not making as much money from Sling as they are from selling to the MSOs in general. So there's going to be a lot of push-pull going on here as the distributors try very hard not to get disintermediated the way that the radio or the music industry got disintermediated. Different facts, but same kind of problem of trying to make sure that they stay relevant as they move forward here. Here's a whole variety of over-the-top alternatives. Not all of these are out today. Some of these are still just planning to be out by the end of the year. Um, but there's tons, and we're probably going to see another dozen or two dozen next year. Most of these have strings attached, have conditions, like only use it on one screen or not get certain kinds of programming, all because everybody's trying to avoid their bundle getting destroyed. Because if the bundle does go away, we think about half of all the networks in the country go away. The economics are not there to support most networks if you had to buy it one at a time. Because on average, most of us only watch 17 networks, period. And you pay for 200 in the bundle, but you pay such low prices for most that that's a better deal than saying, you know, I'd like to watch that show on AMC, and oh, AMC's not in my bundle, I've got to go out and do something. Most people are willing to say, okay, I've got the ability to do anything I want to do. Again, there are a few who just say, I've, I want to do it my way, but most are willing to, to just take the bundle and, and be done with it. Now, let's talk about multitasking. It sort of goes back to this, oh, I was knitting and I didn't notice that the commercial was coming on. Really interesting statistics here. There's five major activities that go on while you're watching TV. Email on the computer. Um, talk or text on a mobile phone. Visit websites on the computer, websites on a mobile phone. 20% of us are doing this most of the time. 10% of us are doing this often. So 30% are awfully distracted as opposed to watching the shows. And you know, hey, that's just the way it is. We're doing a lot more multitasking. But to me, these are huge statistics. And this calls out danger for the whole advertising industry because are you paying attention, even if you're watching the commercials, are you paying attention to the commercials? The stats we see on commercial viewing are that even with normal TV viewing, you see a dip because we watch this second by second. You see a dip in every commercial pod. Now, it doesn't go down to zero. It just goes down maybe a quarter or a third as people surf away to look at other things during the commercials. They could also head out to the kitchen or to the bathroom, and it might look flat, but they aren't there to see it. But you see somewhat of a dip. When you overlay DVRs on that, you see a much bigger dip. It still is quarter to half of all people are still watching commercials. But you see an even bigger dip because on a DVR, you may be fast forwarding through that commercial. So all of that is there, and that's all part of the normal characteristic. But what the advertisers are finding out is they're getting enough people to view, and compared to the cost of what they're paying for it, they feel that the value equation is sufficient. They're getting the value that they're looking for. Now, let's talk about branded entertainment, because this is one solution to the whole problem of commercials and having people skip commercials. You've all seen this phenomenon. We would call it product placement, but the fancy word for it these days is branded entertainment. So obvious use is American Idol. The Coke cups are up. I don't know how many millions of dollars Coke paid for that right, but people are paying heavily for the right to have their logo, to have their product shown on screen. We're able to measure second by second how many households are viewing while the Coke cups are up. We then can overlay a qualitative score that's based on 
do they talk well about Coke, poorly about Coke, spit in the Coke cup? I mean, what, what else is going on here that would reflect positively or negatively on the brand? Think of it also with, TV, uh, with um, autos in TV shows. Many sitcoms, there's an auto there. Are they getting into the car? Is it so far in the background you can barely see it? We're then able to share with these advertisers how many households viewed and what the relative commercial value was, equivalent commercial value was, for that um, commercial as a way to help them understand as they compare that to what they paid for it, are they getting good value for this? But a key is you aren't fast forwarding during this Coke commercial because it's part of the show. And so it's a very effective way to do that. Look at the money. It's gone up 40% in the last five years. $35 billion being spent in the United States on product placements or branded entertainment. Now this includes movies, so it's not totally apples and apples with TV viewing. But TV commercials are $75 billion. So on one hand, this is a huge number compared to that. And that's additive on top of what's being spent on TV commercials. So a lot of advertisers are saying the solution to people fast forwarding is go, go to branded entertainment and get as much of this in as I can. And there are some shows you watch that are painful or movies you can watch that are absolutely painful. So many logos, so many products. It's like, oh my God, this is just a commercial as opposed to a, a real show that I'm watching. Now, over the top measurement, we talked at the beginning of this current segment about what's going on with over the top. And I mentioned to some extent, it still is a work in progress. Nielsen and Comscore measure this with a million person panel. They have a little bit of real time information through um, uh, beacon data, uh, pixel data that they're able to get from um, the shows where they embed the pixel in it. We're moving to getting um, app data from providers. So AT&T gives this to us now. We're trying to get our other four major providers to share the same kind of data with us. And so for that is if you view a show on your tablet on AT&T's app, AT&T knows what you're viewing. And they give us that log data so we're able to know exactly what anybody who's viewing on that app is, is doing. Most of the over-the-top viewing is done on apps because you don't have to know what network a show's on. You know, if you're already an AT&T subscriber, you go to the app. It's easy. It's all laid out there in the same way you see it on the TV screen. It's very easy to do. Um, we're trying to get into the other forms of it as well, but we will definitely have an awful lot of app data as we move forward here. We're able to take our data um, that we have from um, MasterCard or from other um, payment cards. And if you're a McDonald's franchisee, you know your trading area, and they will give data as to your own city.